Well, let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 15, shall we? Mark chapter 15. Uh, last time we were together, we looked at the result of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And we saw the crucifixion of Jesus resulted in a variety of things. One very important thing is it resulted in the forgiveness of sin. And what a big issue this is because we're all sinners. <laughs> Okay, that was weak. Uh, look, I realize this is not a popular message to win friends and influence people, but the truth of the matter is we're really all messed up. Okay, now you're just patronizing me. Uh, but because of the cross, you and I can have our sins forgiven, Psalm 103.12, and forgotten, Hebrews 10.17. It also resulted in the righteousness of Christ being credited to our account, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And I got to tell you, this should bless the socks off all our stinky little feet. Well, this brings us to verse 38, where we will be looking at the response to the crucifixion. The response to the crucifixion. And that is in verses 38 through 47, the end of the chapter. So uh, let's pick up our reading in verse 37 just for a little context. Let's pick up in verse 37 and we'll read down through verse 47. Mark chapter 15 beginning in verse 37. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood opposite him, saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last. He said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, and Joseph, and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now, when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went in to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. And when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid." Now, just a cursory reading of our text indicates we're going to be looking at the response to the crucifixion. And if you're taking notes or outlining our study today, there are four of them. Four responses we want to look at as a result of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Number one, the first response, and this is subtle, but it's there, is the response of God the response of God. Uh, let's just read verse 38 again. Drop back to verse 38. It says, Then, of course, when Jesus breathed his last breath from verse 37, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, <laughs> as Jesus breathed his last breath on the cross, the veil was torn in two. Now, according to verse 33, it was the ninth hour or three o'clock in the afternoon according to Jewish way of timekeeping. And this becomes significant because this was the time of day which the priests would have been in and around the temple praying, preparing sacrifices for that Sabbath. Remember, this was the day of preparation, and we'll talk more about that, uh, Lord willing, next time we're together in chapter 16. Now, they would have no doubt saw the temple veil torn in two. But no carefully, class. According to verse 38, it was torn in two from top to bottom. Now that tells us that it was God who tore it in two. Why? Why would God tear the veil of the temple in two? Well, that's a good question. Uh, turn over to Hebrews chapter 10, if you would, please. 
Hebrews chapter 10. Because in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of the Hebrews gives us a little information uh, to help us answer that question. Now when we talk about the veil in the temple, Remember, this was the temple built by Herod, Herod the Great. He was a master builder. Uh, Many believe this temple was one of the wonders of the world. And the veil in the temple did at least two things. Number one, it separated the holy place, the first room in the temple, from the holy of holies, the second room in the temple. And so there was, a, there was a separation between the holy place and the holy of holies. But there's a second thing the veil separated. It, se- it separated the people from God. Because only the high priest could go into the holy of holies, passing by the veil, one day out of the year on Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, the sixth feast in Judaism as he would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood on the on the seat the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant thus atoning for the sins of Israel so by tearing the veil this becomes pretty significant because the veil was pretty significant physically that is Um, many scholars believe that this veil was 60 feet Tall. Remember, this was the temple Herod built. It was, it was a beautiful facility. 60 feet tall. It would have been 30 feet wide. And are you ready for this? 10 inches thick. This was quite a piece of tapestry, we might say. 10 inches thick. So when God tore the veil, in effect, what he was saying is he is eliminating the separation between us and Him, between the people and God. Uh, Take a look, if you would, at verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, pick it up in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest or the holy of holies, how? By the blood of of Jesus through his crucifixion by a new and living way which he consecrated or inaugurated the word means to dedicate for us how through the veil which is his flesh so there's a parallelism here going on between the tearing of the flesh of Jesus on the cross of Calvary through his shed blood and the tearing of the veil in the temple thus making access to God for all the people. Verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So when God tore the veil, He now made access to himself for us, we might say. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Let us come boldly to the throne room of God, that we may receive grace and mercy in our time of need. And I don't have to tell you that there are religious groups today who say, Well, you know, you can't pray to God. You come to me, and I will pray to God for you. And for $29.95, I will make sure my prayer goes through. (laughs) Follow me? Very sad, very tragic. But Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.14 that he tore down the middle wall of division. So now you and I have direct access to God. We move from religion to relationship. We move from the law to love. And now we can crawl up in the lap of God, so to speak, and say, Abba, Father, because now we've entered into that personal relationship with God. How? Through the tearing of the veil, which is his flesh, Jesus Christ. Absolutely amazing. Back to Mark chapter 15. Now, just as a side note, God's response to the crucifixion not only involved the tearing of the veil, It also involved the shaking of the earth. What do you mean? 
Well, we don't have time to turn there, but in Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, it says, and behold, in the parallel passage, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split in two, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And we'll talk more about that, Lord willing, next time we're together in chapter 16 in dealing with the resurrection. Stay tuned. More on that next week. But here we see that in addition to the veil being torn, the earth began to shake. The rocks began to split in two. Now, we know why the veil was torn in two, because it, it eliminated the the separation between us and God. So the question is, why was there an earthquake? Why were the rocks split in two? Oh, you want to know the answer? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. We're not told. If I had to guess, and I do, I would say it's a parallelism, if you would, to Revelation chapter 11. What do you mean? Well, in Revelation chapter 11, verses 13 through 19, when the two witnesses appear during the tribulation, it's a period of time when God is pouring out His wrath on a God-rejecting world for that seven years of tribulation, from Revelation 6 through 18, with the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. So it's a time of judgment. Yeah, okay, good. Three of you are awake. Yes, it's a time of judgment when God judges sin. Very interesting. Because in Revelation 11, 13 through 19, at this point in the, in the tribulation, there is a great earthquake which parallels the judgment of sin on the earth. So it could be, it might be, there's a good possibility that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, and the veil was torn in two, the earth began to shake because it's a picture of God's judgment of sin. Why? Because when Jesus died on the cross, he took our sins upon himself. In fact, 1 Peter 2.24 says he bore our sins in his own body. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says he who knew no sin became sin for us. So, and sin must always be judged. Capish? Back to Mark chapter 15. Let's come to the second response. We said there were four. Number one, it was the response of God. But number two, the second response is the response of the centurion. The response of the centurion. Now, centurions, and we'll see that in verse 39, but centurions are always mentioned in a favorable light in Scripture. Centurions are always mentioned favorably. Kind of interesting. Or not. Uh, now, the, re the response of the centurion is threefold. His response was threefold. Note them carefully, class. Number one, he confessed fully. He confessed fully. Look at verse 39. Back in Mark 15, look at verse 39. It says, Now when the centurion who stood opposite him of Jesus saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There's no doubt in his mind he believed that this man was in fact the Son of God. Now, for you and I, um, we understand what he means when he says that, because for us, we understand that Jesus is, was not the Son of God, but that Jesus is the Son of God. There's a distinction there. However, in his mind's eye, in his way of communicating his faith in, in God, he said this man was the Son of God. He verbalized it. He confessed it. And this becomes important for you and for me. Why? Because Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, he said, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness 
But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Wow. So this is an important aspect of Christianity, and that's to confess Jesus Christ audibly, verbally, tangibly. You say, but but what about the people that can't talk, Clark? Uh, well, no problem. Uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, God looks upon the heart. Now, if so those who can't talk, they're fine. But the point is, if you can talk, you should talk. Okay, that would have been a good spot for a hearty amen. amen. <laughs> okay, I mean, just to confess with your mouth... Um, okay, nobody caught on to the... Okay, two people in the front row, two donuts for you two. Now, the, <laughs> but the point is, this is something we ought to be doing as believers, confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. And for each and every one of us, I, I understand there's different dynamics that we go through in life, maybe with family members or friends or coworkers or, or even on the job. I, I get that. But any and every opportunity that God opens the door for us to open our big fat mouth and tell people about Jesus, we ought to do it. And that's the point here. So number one, he confessed fully. Number two, he feared greatly. He feared greatly. Now we don't get it here, but in the parallel account in Matthew 27, 54, it says, when he saw these things, he feared greatly. And when we talk about him fearing, we're not talking about him being afraid. The word carries the idea of having a, a reverential awe of what Jesus did on the cross and who Jesus was as the Messiah. And so he had this awe, this reverence of who Christ was. He feared greatly. And boy, what a, what a great example that should set for each and every one of us. <sighs> having that fear of God, that reverential awe of who God is. And I fear that sometimes, as believers, we've been believers for a long, long time, we've been going to church for a long, long time, we sing songs, we have Bible study, we do this, we do that, and we just kind of are on cruise control with our Christianity. We're just kind of going through the motions after a while. And there's really no reverential fear, awe of God in our hearts or in our lives. And we feel like we can do this or do that or go here and go there and somehow, well, it's not that big of a deal. Hey, wait a minute. Hebrews 4.13 says something really good. <laughs> oh, in Hebrews 4.13, it says, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. Oh, no, that's Proverbs 15.3. Excuse me. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He sees the good and the evil. Oh, I know, Hebrews 4.13. There's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to him to whom we must give an account. Look, gang, God sees it all. He knows, he knows what's going on in your heart right now. He knows what you're thinking right now. And you need to knock it off. <laughs> We're not hiding anything from God. We need to have that reverential awe of who God is. He's always there. He always sees us. We think that somehow because we're out of town or our family's away that somehow we can get away with this, that, or the other. Are you kidding me? God's always there. He sees all. He knows all. And that should scare the far out of all of us. Back to Mark chapter 15. Let's come to the third and final response of the centurion. I like this one. Number one, he confessed fully. Number two, he feared greatly. And number three, I like this, he glorified God totally. He glorified God totally. In the parallel account in Luke 23, 57, or 47, excuse me, Luke 23, 47, it says, when he saw these things, he glorified God. He glorified God. And when, listen, gang, when we understand all what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, how could we not live our lives to bring glory to God? And this is a great application for all of us. Because wherever we go, whatever we do, every action, every reaction, every deed, every word, everything we say, everything we do, everywhere we go should really bring glory to God. You say, well, Clark, what about driving on the 91? <laughs> okay, there might be some exceptions. No, just kidding. <laughs> 
Look, especially on the 91. Hey, look, I realize there's a lot of neutrality in our life. Things are amoral. They're not right or wrong necessarily. I get that. But hopefully when we deal with other people, when we interact with others at work, at home, at school, at play, wherever we're at, when, when the words come out of our mouths, hopefully everything we do and everywhere we go and every word we speak will bring glory to God. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, he says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Well, let's come to the third response, shall we? We've looked at the response of God. Number two, we've looked at the response of the centurion. Number three, let's take a look at the response of the women. The response of the women. That's in verses 40 and 41. Uh, ultimately, their response is they follow Jesus, and we'll talk more on that in a moment. Uh, but in, as we look at this uh, third point, in verse 40, we have, a, we have uh, some information about the women. Notice in verse 40, it says, there were also women looking on from afar. Now, in John's account, in John 19, 27, we're told that they were at the foot of the cross. So at some point in time, all of these women were right at the foot of the cross. And apparently... <laughs> they just couldn't they couldn't take it anymore looking up and seeing Jesus on the cross as they had plucked out his beard as they beat him as they flogged him as they nailed him to the cross as he was virtually unrecognizable it apparently apparently was more than they could take so Mark tells us here in verse 40 that they looked on from afar. Luke 23, 49 says they stood at a distance. And this really points to the heart of these women. Their heart was so grieved and so broken for what was done to their Lord that they just couldn't take it anymore. And I fear that sometimes our hearts get so callous to, to that because we read about it, we study it, we talk about it. For so many years as Christians, we just kind of gloss over it or, or we don't really think that deeply about it. But boy, I'll tell you, this should really uh, touch all of our hearts as we look at the response of these women. Now, there are three of them that are mentioned here. Number one, the first woman in verse 40 is Mary Magdalene. Now, Mary Magdalene, her, that Magdalene's not her last name, by the way. Uh, she's from the city of Magdala, or Migdal. Uh, it's located just north of the city of Tiberias. Uh, right before you make the turn from the western side to the northern shore toward Capernaum, or Capernaum. In, in fact, um, there in Migdal, several years ago, uh, they were getting ready to build a little strip mall, a little shopping center. And of course, anytime you put a shovel in the dirt in Israel, you're going to find something historic. And they did. There in Migdal, or Magdala, they found an alabaster flask that held perfume. Boy, does that sound familiar. So the Franciscans came in. They bought up the whole site. They stopped the construction of the, of the uh, shopping center. They bought everything. And they began excavations. And they found a first century Jewish synagogue. And they ended up building a hotel on that site with the archaeological digs that you still go to today. In fact, when you go into that hotel, I've stayed there a couple of times, as you walk through the lobby, there's a plexiglass floor that you can look down and see the excavations. It's amazing. It's breathtaking. And this is where Mary Magdalene was from. And you can see it today. Now, according to Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, this was the woman that Jesus cast seven demons out of. So that's Mary Magdalene. Number two, the second is Mary, the mother of James, the less, and the mother of Joseph. Now, according to uh, John 19, 25, this Mary was the wife of Cleopas, who is also called Alphaeus. 
Now she, of course, had the two sons, Joseph and James. Now this is James the less. Don't confuse James the less with James the more. <laughs> no donuts for me. Okay, fine. <laughs> now what makes him James the less? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, but he's not the other James the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James. This James, James the Less, was one of the 12 apostles that followed Jesus. Now, the third person, of course, is Salome, according to verse 40. Salome. Now, Salome is the mother of James and John, the husband Zebedee. Remember James and John in Luke's gospel? They were going through the Samaritan village, and they wanted to call fire down from heaven. And Jesus says, oy vey, you guys have no idea what's going on. And in Mark chapter 3, verse 17, they're called sons of thunder. Yeah. And this is their mother. Now, uh, there were many other women, look at verse 41, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, then the north, up in the north, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So ultimately, the response of the women is they followed Jesus. According to verse 41, they followed him from the Galilee to Jerusalem and to the cross. But they also followed him to the grave. Drop down to verse 47. Look at verse 47. It says, And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where they laid him. So they not only ministered to him, they followed him during his ministry on earth all the way to the grave. And I guess the question that faces each and every one of us by way of application <laughs> is where are we at in our lives in following Jesus? I mean, do we follow Jesus when it's convenient, when we have a little extra time? Do we follow Jesus only when things go south in our life and everything's upside down? Is, is that the only time we follow Jesus? Follow me? See what I did there? Okay. <laughs> okay, nobody got it. <laughs> He's going, I've had enough. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. No, I know. He's okay. He's fine. He's a, good, he's a good man. Now, uh, <laughs> the point is, here's the point. We need to look at our, how are we following Jesus? You know, Jesus said in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and follow me. In Mark 8, 34, Jesus said, if, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. It's all about following Jesus. And we need to look at our own lives. How are we following him? Only when things go bad or when it's convenient? And, and for each and every one of us, this is a wake-up call as it pertains to our own lives. You know, I, I, it reminds me of that old hymn Pastor Chuck used to lead us in singing at Calvary Costa Mesa many, many years ago. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Well, back to Mark chapter 15. Uh, let's come to the fourth and final response we want to look at, and we'll start wrapping this up right here. And this involves the response of Joseph. The response of Joseph in verses 42 through 46. We have already looked at verse 47. Uh, take a look at verse 42 because we're given a, a time reference here. Look at verse 42. It says, now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So here we have a reference to time. It's not only evening, but it's the preparation day before the Sabbath. Now, according to John's account in John 19.31, this wasn't just any ordinary Sabbath. This was a high Sabbath. Now, remember, during this period of time, there were three Shabbats, or three Sabbaths. There was Passover, which was on the 14th day of Nisan. It was a single-day feast. 
commemorating the passing over of the death angel. The second Passover came on the following day. It was the Feast of Unleavened Bread from the 15th of Nisan to the 21st of Nisan, a seven-day feast. But there was a third Shabbat or a third Sabbath, and that, of course, was the regular Sabbath, which starts Friday night to Saturday night. So which high Sabbath is he talking about? Well, probably many scholars believe that this would be the day of preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, only because in John 19 it talks about a high Sabbath, not the regular Shabbat. And, and Lord willing, we'll put all of this together and it'll become pretty significant next time we're together in chapter 16 when we look at the resurrection. More on that next time we're together. Now, this particular Joseph is mentioned and highlighted in all four gospel accounts. And we know a little bit about this Joseph, by the way. Uh, we would mention six things about him, and they go very quickly. Number one, note first of all, he's from Arimathea. He's from Arimathea. Look at verse 43. In verse 43 of Mark 15, he is Joseph of Arimathea. Now, according to Luke 23, 51, this city, Arimathea, is called the city of the Jews. Now, we don't know exactly where it's at. Many believe it's in and around the outskirts of Jerusalem in the suburbs, we might say. So number one, he's from Arimathea. Number two, he's a member of the Sanhedrin, a member of the Sanhedrin. Look at verse 43 again. It says a prominent council member. Now, the word council is the word Sanhedrin. Uh, the Sanhedrin was the 71-member ruling body of the Jews, the Supreme Court of Judaism. There were 70 members plus the high priest making 71. But note carefully, he's not just any council member. He is a prominent council member, which implies that he was very wealthy, very powerful, very connected. Number three, I like this one. He was waiting for the Messiah. He was waiting for the Messiah. Look at verse 43 again. It says, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. So he believed in God's promise of the coming Messiah. Remember, before the cross, all the Old Testament saints, by faith, looked forward to God's promise of the Messiah. We, after the cross, look back by faith faith to God's promise of the Messiah. So we're all looking by faith to the Messiah, to the Christ, which, by the way, he believed Jesus was. You say, Clark, are you sure? Oh, yes. Because in Matthew 27, 57, it says he was a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Christ. So clearly, he believed Jesus was the Messiah. Number four, he had courage. The fourth thing I learned about Joseph, he had courage. Look at verse 43 again. In the middle of the verse, it says, And taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Verse 44, Pilate marveled that he was already dead and summoned the centurion to ask him if he had been dead for some time. And when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. So he had courage. Now, I don't, now this is my own personal opinion, I don't believe the courage that he mustered up was to stand in front of Pilate. We already discovered he was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, rich and powerful, no doubt. So for him to go to Pilate was probably ordinary, we might say. You say, well then, what was the courage toward? Well, I think we get a little hint from that in John's account. In John chapter 19, verse 38, we're told that this Joseph was a disciple of Jesus Christ, but a secret disciple for fear of the Jews. So he was fearful of what would happen to him when he was no longer a secret disciple, but an open disciple, one who followed Jesus openly. So I think the courage we see in this man is that he stepped up and stepped out in faith to proclaim his faith in Jesus being the Messiah in asking for the body of Jesus. Because as a result of this, he no doubt 
would lose his power, his prominence, and his position in the council or the Sanhedrin. And I, I think for some of us, we don't fully comprehend this idea. Now, granted, some of you might have come out of a, a very strict Roman Catholic background or even a, a Mormon or Jehovah Witness kind of a thing. And, and as soon as you came to faith in Christ, maybe your family disowned you. Maybe your company fired you. And, 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 and I understand that. But boy, in this culture, even to this day, if you live in Israel. In fact, there's a very good friend of mine, Daniel Carmel, born and raised in the Galilee. I've known him for almost 30 years. Uh, he was the boat captain on those nice little wooden boats that take us out in the Sea of Galilee. And he would take us out every year, and uh, we would sing some songs and, and, and have Bible study about faith, you know, Peter walking on water and so on and so forth. And uh, over the years, him taking out multitudes of Christian groups on the Sea of Galilee, eventually he came to faith in Jesus Christ. He got saved. And he also played the keyboard and sang. So he started singing Christian songs in Hebrew on the boat on the Sea of Galilee. It just makes the hair stand up on your, wherever it is. Uh, <laughs> it's just amazing. It's amazing. But here's what happened. The other boat owners were losing business because everybody wanted to go on Daniel's boat. You remember that. We were there many times. Okay, good. You nod your head. Fine. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you heard me or saw me or what. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, Mike, been, Mike and I have been on there many times. Remember, remember that? He got fired and, and he couldn't get a job. His family disowned him. The whole community in the Galilee, tight-knit community, just shunned him. He could, he could do nothing. God opened the door for him to find this junky old boat, fix it up, and get it on the Sea of Galilee. So he got, jumped through all the hoops, got the permits, God did all this stuff. So now he's got his own boat. It's called Faith. Amen. Sailing on? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then he, found, he got a second boat. Hope. And he's praying for a third. Love. Good job. Okay. <laughs> Faith, hope, and love. Two donuts for you, brother. <laughs> but I'll tell you what. While we might not be able to fully comprehend what happens to those who come to faith in Christ and Israel, I believe the example that Joseph set should really be the example in all of our lives. Because no matter what happens with family or friends or jobs or loved ones or careers, man, we got to put Jesus Christ first and foremost. So he had courage. Number, number five, real quickly, we have to hurry. We only have 45 minutes left. He was generous. He was generous. Look at verse 46. In verse 46, it says, then he bought fine Linen. Wow. He was generous. In fact, according to Matthew 27, 60, it was his tomb that had never been used that he gave to Jesus. Boy, talk about generosity. His response to the crucifixion was one of generosity. And I guess the point for us by way of application is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And that is no matter what we give the Lord in our time, our talents, and our treasures... It could never compare to what he gave us. Because he's given us eternal life. He's freed us from sin, death, and hell itself. And as a result of that, we owe him everything. Like that old hymn, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white. As snow. Number six, and finally, he was compassionate. He was compassionate. Look at verse 46 again, if you would, please. It says, then, they brought, then he bought fine linen. Look, he took him down, wrapped him in the linen, laid him in the tomb. It was his tomb, which had been hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Boy, what a compassion this, this is displaying for you and me. Now, according to John 19.39... He wasn't alone. A fellow by Nicodemus helped him. 
But you got the picture, right? Here's Jesus on the cross. <sighs> Broken, bloodied. <sighs> Dead. And Joseph had to secure a ladder. Some kind of hammer or something to pull the nails out of his hands and his feet. <laughs> Take his body down off of the cross. Wrap him in the linen and put him in the tomb. Talk about compassion. And, and I guess the point for us is, is pretty simple in all of this. What is our response to the crucifixion? How do we respond to what Jesus did for us? Are we bringing glory to God in everything we do? Are we verbally telling people about our faith in Jesus? Are we giving Him of our time, our talents, our treasures? Hopefully our response to the Lord is something that will not just bring glory to God, but bring others to faith. Father, we are so grateful for these few minutes together. Lord, and just this opportunity to study your word. And Lord, just how it's so rich, so powerful, so practical, how it applies to each and every one of us. So Lord, we are humbled and grateful for your word because your word is truth. Your word is life. And I pray that by your spirit, Father, we would be those who follow you all the days of our life. And we ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen.